end gap three. And that's that comes up when you have one sequence and another sequence where you think that the first one, S1, let's say, <coughs> the natural uh, alignment that is probably of biological interest has the end of one matching somehow some good or bad matches in here, the beginning of the other. So a suffix of one and a prefix of the other. And one of the applications we said was in shotgun sequencing. For those of you who don't know um, what shotgun sequencing is, let me just say very, very briefly, uh, one of the things that's involved in sequencing long DNA is, uh, is a method called shotgun sequencing, and it's... Uh, it's predicated on, on the, uh, well, it's required because uh, for a single interval, a single read of DNA, you can reliably read what the sequence is on existing machines only to length 500 nucleotides, let's say. So if I have a long sequence of DNA of length a million and I want to know what the sequence is, and I have machines available that can only read 500 lengths, uh, reliably, what do I do? Well, the obvious thing is you try to read the first 500 and you try to cut it there and then read the next 500. And that has not worked for as long as people have thought about doing it that way. Um, so instead, they do something called shotgun sequencing, which means that you make many copies. So this is, let's say, length 10 to the 6th. And you make many copies of the DNA of interest. OK? And then you cut them up randomly. That's possible. Um, sometimes, I guess, you can even you can take your copies of DNA. You can zap them with some electricity. You can shake them really hard. I guess there's some chemicals you can put in there. But the end result is that you've broken up these copies of the Fragments, and actually, I'm glossing over lots of details because, for example, one detail is that in the end you only want fragments that are roughly the same length. But at any rate, uh, you take enough of these copies, not 10 to the 6 copies, but I'm just saying if we want to sequence something that's a million long. And now you have all these fragments. Now, in the, in the process of cutting them like that or breaking them, all the order uh, and copy separation is gone. So you just have now soup of all these fragments. So just some long, some short. OK? And let me just say my many copies are, let's say, 10. <coughs> this is, again, I'm being actually not uh, accurate in terms of the way this procedure actually goes. But hopefully, just uh, all I'm really trying to do is motivate this problem. This is a bit of a digression. But now that we've cut these 10 copies in random ways, we get out a soup of copies. If I look at a particular co little interval here, a little fragment, I don't know where it came, which, which one of these copies it came from. I don't know where in a particular copy it came from. All I have is that little fragment. Okay. Now, if I take the fragments that are of the right length, and if I've done this uh, cutting properly or picking from the cutting ones properly, I'll find enough that have the, the lengths that a single machine, a machine can read in a single read or can sequence in a single read. So I pull one out, it's like 300, 400, 500, 600, some, something of the length that a, uh, a machine can actually sequence. Then you learn 
the sequence of this fragment. Okay, so this fragment is uh, ACCT, ACC, etc. So you do them, you pull out enough of these little pieces, and now what do you have? You've got a jigsaw puzzle problem. You've got, you, you, you're trying to figure out what the original sequence of length a million was. Now you have all these fragments of length 500, say, multiple copies, 10, let's say, um, you know, from 10 copies of the DNA, and you've got all these little pieces, and you have to try to put them together in a way that... Um, that tells you what the original million length sequence is. All right. it's, a, it's a puzzle. It's, a, it's, like, it's not really a jigsaw puzzle, but it's uh, a puzzle. You know that this is length a million, and that's very helpful. So what are you really trying to do? What can you exploit? What's the, what's the idea that you can take advantage of? You see this, this fragment here, how it overlaps the end part the suffix of this overlaps the prefix of this because these things are cut randomly, broken randomly. You have a suffix of one overlapping a prefix of another. You have this suffix here overlapping this prefix and so on. You've got a lot of these things. You also have some other kind of matches that are not as useful. But if you look around, you've got a lot of suffix-prefix matching going on here. And um, what you do to try to fit all these things together so that you end up with 10 copies of length a million, 10 copies out of this soup. You want to have 10 identical sequences that are of length a million. You start by doing suffix-prefix matches like this. You want to know for every pair of fragments, for every pair of fragments, what is the best suffix-prefix match? Alignment. Okay. Count the number of matches. You want to find a positioning, the suffix here over the prefix there, to maximize the number of matches, minus the number of mismatches, minus the number of spaces. Well, actually, because this comes from sequencing, uh, you're going to have different penalties. For example, spaces are not uh, that... Um, really that likely, a space would be a, a sequencing, a, a significant sequencing error because these, if these really did come from the same interval of the long sequence, then these really should be identical. Okay, and so why aren't they identical is because of some small sequencing errors. Sequencing errors might give you mismatches, but you should only, only expect a small number of them. And spaces... That's, that's a, uh, an error that's really um, even less likely. So we would need penalties here. We're trying to maximize matches, and we would have a fairly big penalty for a space because that's a very rare type of an error that would happen, and a moderate penalty for a mismatch. But again, you have to pick, pick the right uh, parameters, right penalties. Okay? So after you learn all these suffix-prefix matches, you'll see... Pairs that obviously did not, uh, one was not the appropriate suffix uh, overlapping a prefix. That just, their, their matching, suffix prefix matching values were so, is so awful that that's not a possibility. And you'll see other ones that look really great, and then you'll say, well, I really think that these had to have been neighbors in the original sequence. It must have been something like this. And you build up those pairwise deductions uh, and uh, with other kinds of algorithmic thinking, you ultimately end up with 
10 copies or six copies uh, of the full million length string uh, by putting together the, the fragments in the appropriate way, exploiting the suffix prefix match. Okay, that was the shotgun sequencing. It's good for you to have some sense of what it is, how you sequence long sequences just with the ability to sequence small uh, 600 length, 500 length sequences. And this idea of random or shotgunning, uh, breaking up of the sequences into fragments. But what I really want you to see just is that this is a motivation for um, end gap free alignment. Because now we're going to talk about how do you do end gap free alignment. We know how to do global alignment by dynamic programming. We know how to do local alignment by dynamic programming. How do I now do um, end gap free? And remind, let me remind you. Uh, the objective function here now is just maximize the number of matches minus the number of mismatches minus the number of spaces. But spaces, we can throw away these spaces. We don't count them, and we don't throw away, and we throw away those spaces. So. I would say minus the number of spaces minus, well, minus the number of spaces not at either end. Okay. Of the alignment. Okay. So actually maximize like that. So if we have a space or a, at either end, if we have a, a sequence of spaces, that's a gap. A gap at the left end or a gap at the right end is thrown away. So it's only spaces inside here that uh, we would count in this objective function. Okay? So how do we efficiently... Compute end gap end gap free alignment. By the way, um, for those of you who are here, or those of you who watch this on late night TV, uh, I'm thinking of of um, a midterm question based on how this is done, okay? So if you understand the logic of how you do end gap free, and of course, in the process, understand the logic of global and local, uh, that will prepare you well for a particular midterm question that, I'm, that I have in mind. Okay, so how do you efficiently compute end gap free? Again, we want to formulate this by dynamic programming. <coughs> Okay, formulation. So that means, um, again, I'm just going to use the same terminology. Vij is the best value uh, obtainable. If we just use the first i characters of S1 and the first j characters of S2, OK? But under this objective function, the objective function where we're max maximizing the number of matches minus mis mismatches minus spaces that are not at either end of the alignment, okay? So what I'm claiming is that we can use the same general recurrence relation for Vij that we had before, but we need to change the, that we had for global alignment. Because after all, except for the end gaps, this stuff in here looks like a global alignment. 
Okay. So actually, if you think about this in terms of local alignment, local alignment wanted a substring in the first string and a substring in the second string that maximized their global alignment. Now we're saying we want a substring which is a suffix of one and a prefix of the other, which maximizes their alignment value. So the portions that we take into the objective function, that, that's a global alignment. And so the global alignment uh, recurrences should apply. So really all that changes is when you, one thing you might imagine, which the only thing, would be the only thing to change, is somehow how we treat the base case, letting us throw away uh, a gap on the left end, and how we change somehow where we get the optimal value from, which lets you throw away stuff on the right end. Okay? Now, how do we... How do we do it when we look at local alignment so that we made it so that anything at the left end, any gap at the left end could be thrown away? What do we do for that? A gap at the left end says you're using up some characters from one string, but not any characters from the other string. And in global alignment, we had to pay one space for each one of those things. In local alignment, we got to say, well, that's free. How did we do that? Yeah? Uh, we initialized the row, the first row and column. To yes. Those to zero. Right. We put zeros in the first row. Let's say this is for S1 and this is for S2. And we put zeros in the first column. OK? And it said uh, what that really meant, let's say this is position I. No, this is J, sorry. It says, oh, yeah, I can use up J characters of, of S2 and not align them or use up any characters of S1, and that still just co costs me zero. Because we don't want to count. We don't want to penalize these kind of gaps. Okay? So, and... That's, that's uh, for this row. This column is for a picture that would look like this. It would have um, S1. You'd use up some portion of S1, I characters, but nothing of S2. And this gap, which in global alignment costs you something, is free in this end gap free alignment, and that's why you want zeros all the way down here. Okay? And then we have the normal recurrence relations that fill things in here, but how, do we, how are we going to take care of uh, gaps at the right end? We want this to be a free gap. How do we make that free in our computation? Okay. First of all, what does it mean? Here, we've used up all the characters to the end of S2 in this little picture. Okay. M of them. But we haven't yet used up all the characters from S1. So where are we in this table? Anybody see? Where are you when you've used up all the characters from S2, and there are M of them, but you haven't used all the characters from S1? Yeah? It'd be like on the right edge, but up from the bottom. Yeah, you'd be on the column M, OK? Somewhere in the column M, but not here. The end here is where you've used up all the M characters from S2 and all the N characters from S1. That's, that's this place right here. If you've used up all of the characters from S2, but not all the characters from S1, then you're somewhere in here, but not there. Okay? And conversely, 
what if we have um, something like that, where you've used up all the characters from S1, but not all the characters from S2? Where are you in the picture? You're somewhere along the bottom row. Okay, but not here. Okay. Well, possibly. I mean, the end gap free certainly allows the possibility that the two sequences, the end characters align with each other. That's permitted. Okay. But if we actually did have a gap, <coughs> then we'd be somewhere either in this column, but not at this position, or somewhere in this row, but not at this position. Okay. So with that, the question is, how do we get free gaps on the right end in our computation? See, any place that you are on this column, let's say that spot, that gives you an alignment of all of S2 with only some prefix of S1. So this is where you're getting the values of suffix prefix matches where the suffix comes from S2 and the prefix comes from S1. This is where you're getting the values uh, along in here you're using up all of, of uh, S1 but not necessarily all of S2. So in here, you're getting the, the values where S1 uh, provides the suffix and S2 provides the prefix. Okay. So my question a minute ago was, if I want end gaps on the right to be free, how do I turn that into a computational step? What do I do in the computation? Yeah. Like an if statement saying if you have gotten to column M, then you can use a zero like you did before the alignment for the. Um... Close. Okay. The, the the suggestion was that if you have an alignment, you get into one one of these, either this column or this row, you can somehow make the rest zeros. Uh, yeah. What was the question? Uh, the question is. I want a computational method that computes the best end gap free alignment. Okay? Now we realize that we should set these guys to zero. And we realize that the end gap free alignment the suffix pre is a the suffix prefix kind of alignment. And therefore, we're going to see the full alignment either ending in this column or in this row. But it doesn't have to be at this position. So how do I turn those observations into an actual algorithm, a computation? Is it possible when you reach either of the ends, you can stop it? You could, but they may not be the best thing. The, 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 question, the suggestion was whenever you get to either this column or this row, stop. Don't go any further. But that may not be necessarily the best thing to do. Yeah. Did you, uh, when you're going down the column, could you instead, instead of subtracting the amount, just you know, maybe zero each time you figure it out the column? Uh, the suggestion was when you go down a column, instead of doing a subtraction, which would happen if you're doing global alignment, just make it equal to the previous value. You could do that, but it wouldn't necessarily be right because maybe there's a value in. Um, Uh, hold on a minute. I was going to say maybe there'd be a value in, in taking some of these negatives that is including more and more of this into the uh, objective, into the alignment, and then you'd pick up some good values later. But those would have to be diagonals. That might work. Actually, the way you set it might work. You have to do your comparisons with the value that was given there through some other entryway. But I, I'm still searching for a slightly different way of saying all that. Okay. Uh, remember in local alignment, what we did 
in order to chop off things on the left end, we let these things be, be zeros. In order to chop off things on the right end, what we did is we filled in the table first, but then we found the entry in the table of largest value. And effectively, that threw away everything here and everything here. But we didn't know when we were filling in the table that this was going to be the best one until we finished the table. So that's the same thing I want to do here. I want to fill out the table completely, but then look in here and look in here for the largest value. And then taking the largest value in these two, this column or this row, that will define uh, the right end of the best suffix prefix match. Yeah. Is it possible that for S2 there is no tail? That is uh, S2 just totally covered by S1? Yeah, and the question is, is it possible that you actually, the best answer really does end there, that the end of S1 and the end of S2 end up aligning? And yes, that's a possibility. So we definitely want to look at this cell as well. Or even uh, Oh, yes. The question is, is it possible that S2's tail is longer than S1? Absolutely. That's, that's, what, that's the primary thing we're dealing with, is that possibility. So, okay, so here's the method. Um, fill in zeros for row zero and column one. Step two, fill in the table with the normal, that means the global occurrences. And step three, find <coughs> the largest, the maximum value in row N or column M. That tells you the, the end location, that largest value, tells you the end location of the uh, alignment. It's going to be the end of one sequence or the other, but not necessarily the end of the other one. And then you do a trace. Let's say it's, it's here. Then you would do a trace back as usual. Until you hit a zero, but now the only zeros are going to be either in the first in the zero column or in the zero row. Okay? But you would do a trace back from here till you either hit the zero row or the zero column. And that will tell you the right, that'll tell you the left end of the uh, of the alignment. Okay, so try to understand the, the logic of this. Um, you know, the global alignment, local alignment end gap free alignments, the logic is all interrelated. Okay, so <coughs> now I'm going to switch gears a little bit. Now we've been looking at algorithms, and you're going to have on your next lab uh, the, the task of turning the Needleman program into an, a program that does the local alignment calculation. We haven't done any traceback, so those programs don't actually produce an alignment. But they do, they calculate a number, uh, a local alignment number, and it, it will be equally easy to ask you to uh, produce one that gives you an end gap free number as well, because both of those are just small changes of the Needleman program. All right, and I want to switch gears a little bit. We're now focusing or preparing to. Uh, to get into BLAST. Some people have used BLAST, by the way. The BLAST is sort of the dominant program out there that doesn't do alignment but looks for uh, good local alignment, tries to approximate local alignment between a query sequence, one, one sequence that's, that's new, and all the sequences in a database. And uh, there's quite a lot to say about it. But what I want to do today is, is talk a little bit about more about probability and statistics of the type that might be useful, it's going to be useful in talking about BLAST, and compare and contrast that a little bit to the analysis that you saw last week
for the expected longest common subsequence. Okay, so today we're going to be talking about uh, eventually getting to, well, actually talking about expected length of longest common substring. It's different than subsequence. We're also going to be talking about the expected length of the longest match between a, uh, a sequence, a fixed uh, string, and some other longer string. So what's a longest common substring? Is you're given two strings, S1 and S2, and you have two substrings that are identical. Okay, they have to be contiguous. A, A, B, C, A, A, B, C. They're together, contiguous. But longest, so this one is different, and this one is different. Okay? So they match completely, uh, but you can't extend that match on either side. And this is the longest match, the longest substring that's in both S1 and S2. And we're interested in the length of this, so this is length 4. What does this remind you of? It should remind you of something. Something that we did, that we've been talking about recently. Well, it, it only has matches. It doesn't have mismatches. It doesn't have spaces. But otherwise, it's kind of reminiscent of local alignment, right? We want a something inside one and inside the other that's identical. Now we're talking about absolutely identical. So it's a little bit simpler than talking about alignment because alignment allows spaces and mismatches. Now we're just talking about matches, okay? But nonetheless, it's the point is we're looking for something that's contiguous here inside one and the other. All right. So I want to try to calculate, I want to try to derive what is the expected length of the longest common substring. If I let both of these strings be random strings, just this is the, the way we talked about it. I wasn't here, but expected <coughs> length of the longest common subsequence. The two sequences are generated by picking at each position a character picking uniformly from an alphabet of size Z. Okay? So, by the way, can anybody remind me of what was derived? You should all be able to because you're dealing with it in this week's lab. Um, what's the expected length of longest? common subsequence. Subsequence is different than substring. Substring has got to be contiguous. Subsequence, you can pick out a character here and another character there, and as long as it's in some left to right order, that's a subsequence. It doesn't have to all be together. And longest common subsequence is that you have, these are the same, and then these are the same, um, there's a common subsequence, and I haven't shown you the rest of it, but you know that, that's a, that's a cartoon of longest common subsequence. And what did we what do we know about the expected length of the longest common subsequence? Right. Now that, no, that, that's the, uh, that, those, are the, those are the values you would put into the, those are the cost parameters you'd put into the Needleman algorithm to find, to compute the longest common subsequence. But I'm, what I'm asking about is what is the expected length of the longest common subsequence 
over random strings. I know that some people know this because we did this in the lab on Monday, uh, you know, started it on this week's lab, and some people certainly talked to me about it. Yeah. And over what? C. Uh, well, okay, C is the, is the size of the alphabet. Okay, so it's about N over C. There is some constant here, which we're not totally sure of, but C is the size of the alphabet. Actually, what we, what we proved in last week was it's greater than or equal to n over c. I wasn't here, but you have the notes, and I know that uh, Professor Martel did this. So when c is 4, if that's DNA, we know that the expected length of the longest common <coughs> subsequence is bigger than n over 4. And actually, it's known, not derived in this class, but known that it should be bigger than n over 2 when C is 4, okay? And let me just point out what that means. Why do we care about this? What, what's, why am I torturing you with all this math? Because if I align two sequences and I have the objective function that was discussed, mentioned just a minute ago, 1 for matches and 0 for mismatches and 0 for spaces, a very simple objective function, but we're, we're trying to understand these things by looking at simple cases. Um, what this says is that you're going to find a relatively long match in there. Two sequences of length 100, for example, and you've got a, a match in there of length 50. That shouldn't be a big surprise. You shouldn't run out and say these two sequences must be historically related or functionally related or structurally related. Uh, if one was a new sequence that you just found, in your lab, and the other one is something from a, a database, and you find this agreement of 50 out of 100 characters, or maybe even 60 out of 100 characters, or 70 out of 100, that's not exciting. Um, unless you have some other reason to think that these are highly related. The point is that they, they, they're, that level of identity, that level of common, commonness, uh, is not rare even if these sequences were random. So if random things give you um, that level of identity, you shouldn't be permitted to conclude that just because of that level of identity, there must be some uh, biological reason that, that these two sequences are related. Okay? That's actually a sort of a philosophical point, but it, it really is at the heart of statistics. And the use of statistics and the use of probability in these uh, sort of issues. If you have a, a, a simple explanation, if, if the phenomenon you're looking at could be something that's, that would happen just if I gave you random sequences, then uh, you're on pretty unfirm ground to conclude it was something, to say for sure it was something other than random. Okay? Although it might be. Now, this is relatively long, n over 4, n over 2. What about for common substrings? We want to focus on this because it's substrings more than subsequences that are used generally if we try to see whether one sequence is really related to another. And in particular, they're very definitely used, or something related to that is used in BLAST. Okay. Last, we'll concentrate on uh, substrings that are identical or nearly so. Okay? Can anybody just sort of guess uh, what the length of the longest common substring might be? Expected length for random st strings? Well, let me just ask a, a slightly easier question. Do you think it will be longer or shorter than the expected length of the longest common subsequence? Shorter. shorter. 
Did I hear anybody say longer? Okay. Um, many people said shorter. Why? Okay, I think for those of you who didn't hear it, the, the, the observation was that uh, longest common, a common substring should give you more confidence that these two are, are related than a subsequence, and therefore you would expect it to be shorter. Some good ideas there, but I'm looking for something simpler. Yeah, in the back, yeah. Oh, the more. Oh. Yeah, well, all the way in the back, yeah. Uh, the more bases you have, the more likely it is that it, it expo each time you add one, that it exponentially goes to a unique uh, size. So, like, you might find quite a few, like eight, but if you go to thirteen, you're gonna have a lot less. Okay, I'm not sure what to take from that, except it, it, uh, it seemed you're saying it, it seems right that one should be shorter than the other. Because it seems harder to get a lot of matches together than a lot of matches. Yeah, I mean, the matches that are together, that's a more constrained thing we're looking for than if we allow them to be spread out. Yeah? Wouldn't it be a while to the end? Every match has equal probability. Yeah. It has to happen continuously. Okay, so you're getting already into the count. Shorter and shorter. You're already getting into the formula, but I, what I really want is a slam dunk observation why it's absolutely crystal clear that the length of the expected longest common substring should be less than the, ex length of the, the expected length of the longest common subsequence. Yeah. This, this is a super that one. Right. Okay, you were in the front and nobody heard you. Let me see if I think somebody else got it. Yeah. Oh, I didn't actually hear what you said. Right. That's why I'm going to. Um, uh, that allows to put spaces in the Yeah, okay, so contiguous sounds more constrained. Okay, let me say, tell you what the answer was up here. Every substring is a subsequence. Okay? The other way is not true. Not every subsequence is a substring. So if I give you two particular strings and I say, what's the longest common substring? 10, say, length 10. That's a candidate number for the longest common subsequence. So you know on that pair of strings, the length of the longest common subsequence has got to be at least as big as 10, at least as big as the length of the longest common substring. And that's true for any two pairs, any pair of, of strings you give me. So if I take an average or whatever sequences you show me, if I take an average over them, the length of the longest common subsequence is going to be greater than or equal to the length of the longest common substring. Okay. That should be a slam dunk uh, proof. Okay, So this is going to be small, smaller. Oh, actually, we haven't, seen, we haven't said strictly smaller yet, but uh, anyway, it's not going to be any bigger than this. Okay, And what do we want? Do we want this to be a lot smaller or only a little smaller. Why do I, what do I mean by want? I mean in terms of using statistics. Again, the use of statistics is that you have two sequences and you would find the longest common substring and you'd like to say, I think that's really weird. You need two sequences length 100 and I found one of length 50, longest common substring, and you'd like to know, is that something I should see with random sequences or I should conclude that because the length is 50 out of 100, that these two are probably related in some non-random way. So for that application, for that use, do you want this expected length to be big or small? OK. Anybody else? It's a question of what do you want in terms of of making statistics useful.
You want the expected length to be big, about as big as subsequence, or you want the expected length to be small? Well, the answer is you want it to be small, because if it's big, then it's going to take very extraordinary matching data, ma matches, to let you conclude the two sequences are related in some non-random way. If it's small, if what you should expect to see in random sequences is a small number or a small percentage of the length, you have a lot of opportunity, therefore, to see the two sequences are, uh, are actually re related in some non-random way. If you only expect, let's say, 10 matches out of 100, and you see 50, then you know, 50 is a big number compared to 10. We'll have to be more precise about that in a minute. But then you get to conclude that, yeah, I think something non-random is going on here. That level of matching probably means something biological. OK, this is the kind of level of hand-waving discussion I want you to remember uh, you know, six months from now or a year from now or 10 years from now because you're going to forget the formulas I'm going to do now. But you have to, I, mean, I really want you to remember what the bottom message, you know, the, the take-home message was about why uh, we're interested in statistics and probability. Everybody here has taken statistics and probability courses, one or more. Most people, most students ha never have a clue as, why, as to why they're taking those courses or what they're supposed to learn from them. You gobble down a lot of formulas, but you have no idea what it's supposed to be for. It's so that you can discriminate things that could happen by random from uh, the things that you're seeing. And if what you're seeing could have been observed by looking at random phenomenon, then you don't have the permission to conclude without some other evidence that uh, what you're looking at isn't just random phenomenon. Okay? Like, it's like looking for UFOs, you know. If, um, you know, if you see some, you know, combination of lights in the, in the sky that could easily be explained by swamp gas, uh, you don't get to conclude that it was a UFO, even though it might be, okay? But the fact that there's an easy ex explanation uh, for something that's, that was not um, a UFO and more common, <coughs> that is random, uh, says that you don't get to conclude that it was, even though it might be. Okay, all right. Um, Okay, expected length of the longest common substring. So we have two random strings. Two random strings. S1 and S2. Each of length N. Okay? And... Each character, each position, <coughs> you spell position, position. Uh, in each position, we choose randomly, that's what it means to be random string, uh, from an alphabet. of size Z. So the alphabet size used to be C. Now it's Z. If you listen to it and you don't listen too carefully, they sound like it's the same. So it shouldn't be too confusing, or maybe it is. Um, so that means choose any particular character with probability 1 over z, and that's what we'll call p. So with probability p, which happens to be 1 over z, 
we'll just pick a character for that position. That's how we think of these two uh, strings that are being um, that are being built up. So first thing I want to do is look at two positions and. Sorry. Next time, we'll talk about the formula. <laughs> <laughs>